The following is a presentation of Chandler Christian Church in Chandler, Arizona. For more information, please go to chandlercc.org. Stand up this morning as we sing it one more time. Give it up for Rick Alonzo. Well, amazing to see what he could do if he had more time, huh? Um, I'm going to sit on a stool here. Uh, uh, Rick and I did the backflip last night, and um, I, uh, no, <laughs> do you believe that? No. Uh, anyway, I twisted my ankle, and so I'm going to have a seat. But uh, let me ask you, at the end of June, we celebrated, uh, or at the beginning of June, we actually celebrated Christmas, which seemed a little weird to some of you. Uh, and now in August, we're going to be celebrating Easter, the resurrection. How many of you brought your copies of the story with you? How many brought? Hold them up so I can see them, all right? Want to see all those? Make sure you bring those. Bring your Bibles with you when you come to church because uh, we use them uh, all the time. And uh, how many of you are up to speed on chapter 27 this week? How many are there? All right, good. Good to see that. Well, uh, last week, Pastor Matt shared with you a uh, great message. And uh, uh, last week, we talked about the crucifixion of Jesus. And in that, we experienced the darkest night of history. The crucifixion of Jesus is certainly the darkest night of of history. And Pastor Matt did an amazing job of sharing with you um, just exactly uh, why Jesus had to die. Why Jesus? I mean, God could have just said, Ollie, Ollie, and free, but he didn't. Why did Jesus have to die? And Matt shared with you very clearly that Jesus had to die, first of all, to satisfy uh, God's justice. God is a just God, a holy God. And because of that, he couldn't just let go, sin go. He just couldn't say, okay, I'll let it go. A just God demands payment for that sin that was done on the basis of what he asks us to do. And so a just God demands that sin be paid for. But the Bible also tells us that Jesus had to die to satisfy God's love. In Ephesians chapter 2, the apostle says that at one time we were enemies of God, separated from him because of our sin. But God, who was rich in mercy... Jesus came to satisfy not only the payment for sin, God's justness, but also to show the love of God for us and to demonstrate God's love in a powerful way. Well, this week, today, we're celebrating history's brightest morning. And my goal, my hope is at the end of today, you'll be able to walk away with an understanding of just why Jesus had to be resurrected. Why Jesus had to be resurrected. Now, as you read through chapter 27, it's amazing to me how thorough the enemies of Christ were uh, in his death. These people were professional executioners, and they knew exactly what they were doing. 
In fact, traditionally, when a person was crucified, the death resulted from asphyxiation, the inability to breathe. When they were hung by a cross by nails or by ropes, the pressure was put upon the middle of their body, their solar plexus, and they were unable to get a breath without pushing up against their feet or pulling up with their arms. And their feet were traditionally nailed to the cross, so to push up would require a great deal of pain as well as strength, as well as to pull themselves up. And as their strength would ebb over a period of time, the ability to pull yourself up and get a breath would go, and as a result of that, asphyxiation would set in, and you would die from suffocation of asphyxiation. And that was the situation with Jesus. And when uh, the persecution came, when the, the, when the crucifixion took place, it happened right around Passover. And the Romans, in order to keep good uh, favor with the Jewish people, traditionally would not leave someone on the cross during Passover. It was an uh, abomination to them to do so. So to hasten up the process of death, what they would do is find out those who were on crosses that were still alive, and they would break their legs. That way they had the inability to push up and get a breath. They would die quicker. And that's exactly what what was happening on that Friday. When they passed through, they were breaking the legs of those who were on cru- being crucified. But when they came to Jesus, these experts in execution realized that Jesus was already dead. There's no reason to break his legs, thus fulfilling prophecy that not one of his bones would be broken. And, but just to make sure, they stuck a spear in his side, and the Bible says that water mixed with blood came pouring out. And let me tell you what that means. In your body, in your heart, around your heart is a thing called a pericardial sac. It's filled with fluid, and it's kind of a shock absorber for the heart. And the heart's in the center of it, and it's filled with fluid around this pericardial sac. And when they stuck the spear in his side, puncturing the lung, and then puncturing that pericardial sac, the fact that blood and water came flowing out tells us that Jesus' heart had exploded. Folks, listen. When Jesus died on the cross, he died of a broken heart. Our sin piled upon him, separated God from himself in a miraculous and amazing way. And the pressure of that sin literally broke his heart. And so when he was pierced, blood and water came out mingled together. The Bible tells us that, that they did an amazing job. The other curious thing as you read through this chapter is that even though Jesus told his followers nearly 20 times that he would die and rise from the dead on the third day, the only ones who seemed to remember that were his enemies. Isn't that amazing? His closest followers that he said it again and again to, they didn't seem to remember it, but his enemies did. In fact, the Jewish authorities went to the Romans and said, listen, uh, you know, there's, Jesus said again and again he was going to rise from the dead on the third day. And we don't think that's possible, but in order to make sure nobody steals the body, we're going to ask you Roman soldiers to put a Roman guard out in front of the tomb and to put a seal on the stone that's been rolled in front of it. Because if you break that seal, you break Roman law, which is capital crime, executable by death. And so put a soldier there to keep guard over it, put a seal on it so no one will break it, so that no one will steal the body. Amazingly, the only people seem to remember were his enemies. One more observation from the chapter is that even when it became apparent that the guards were scattered and the seal was broken and the stone was rolled away and that the tomb was empty, most, most of his followers still didn't believe in the resurrection immediately. Most of them didn't. When the women went to the tomb on that first resurrection day in order to finish the preparation of the burial in the body of Jesus to wash him and finalize the preparations for his burial and his internment in the tomb, when they were on the way wondering who was going to roll the stone away from them, and when they arrived and saw that the stone was rolled away, the steel was broken, the soldiers were gone, they ran up to the tomb and they peered inside, and there were two men dressed in white. They were angels. And they said, why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen just as he said. But even with that, I don't think they truly believed that he rose from the dead. They ran back and told the disciples that Jesus' body was gone, but I don't think that they fully understood cognitively that Jesus had risen from the dead. And when they told the apostles, the apostles Peter and John uh, took off running for the tomb. They left the upper room, and when they ran, and when they got there, they looked inside. And the Bible tells us on page 376 of the story, or John chapter 20, finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed, but I don't think they really believed in the resurrection. Because look at the parenthetical phrase right after that. They still didn't understand from the Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. I think they believed that the body was gone, but I don't think they understood what that meant. Amazingly, 
Even his closest followers didn't believe in the resurrection at first. You remember the two that were on the road to Emmaus? They were walking along, and the Bible says they were downcast. They were despondent. Jesus said, why are you guys so sad? And they said, man, don't you, are you the only one who doesn't know what's going on? We've pinned our hopes on Jesus, and he's dead. The stone's rolled up. Remember Mary? Mary was, Magdalene was the one who went with the women to the tomb on the very early morning. And after they ran back and told the apostles, Mary hung around around the tomb. And this guy came walking around. She thought he was the gardener. He said, why are you crying? And she said, they've taken the body of my Lord, and I don't know where they've put him. See, Mary didn't even believe in the resurrection. Though the angel said he was risen from the dead, Mary didn't even believe in it. And then you've got the ten in the upper room, his disciples. Even though the women ran, the, the, the two from Emmaus ran back, and even though Peter and John ran back, they still didn't believe in the resurrection until Jesus appeared in their midst. And Thomas, remember Thomas? Thomas was in there. He wasn't there when Jesus appeared to the first time in the upper room. And he came a little bit after Jesus had left. And they said, we've seen the Lord. And Thomas said, I will not believe it until I see the nail prints in his hand, until I put my hand in the side where the spear was thrust in. Thomas wouldn't even believe. But even though they didn't believe at first, they very quickly believed in the resurrection. And they were convinced that Jesus was alive. In Acts chapter 1, verse 3, the scripture says this. After his suffering, that is after the crucifixion, Jesus showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs. Circle that phrase. Convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. This phrase, convincing proofs, is unique. It's only used one time in the entire New Testament, and it's used right here. And it's a very technical word. In fact, the root of our word technical comes from the root of this word. The word literally is tekmerion, and the word tekmerion uh, means infallible, absolute, not unquestionable. He said Jesus appeared to them and gave them infallible, unquestionable proof that he was alive by his resurrection. Now, I could spend hours here this morning uh, talking to you about the overwhelming evidence from the resurrection from the dead. And believe me, I could because I study it in detail because this is where the rubber meets the road for the faith. And I'm not going to take time to do that today. We have a mass of resources in our resource center right next to the 242 Cafe. You can go in there and you can get all sorts of books we have, uh, the, uh, fa- um, the Case for Faith and, and the Case for Christ and other books in there will help you understand the data that is solid about the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. We're going to talk about some more of that on Wednesday night in our table groups here as we meet in B200 on Wednesday night. But the fact is, the evidence for the resurrection is strong. How many of you have ever heard of a man by the name of Sir Lionel Lacou? Any ever heard of him? I didn't think so. Sir Lionel Lacou, according to the Guinness Book of World Records, is the most successful attorney, lawyer of all time. Most successful of all time. In fact, he died in 1997. He was from New Guinea, but a British citizen. And in 1985, listen to this, he succeeded in getting his 245th successive murder charge acquitted. That is a successful lawyer. That's the guy you want on your side if you've got a problem. 245 acquittals in a row. He was knighted not once, but twice by Queen Elizabeth. I don't know why. Maybe the first one didn't take. I don't have a clue. But he was knighted twice by Queen Elizabeth. And this guy who was a savvy attorney, who was smart and incredible, tremendous analytical skills, able to dissect fact from fiction, wouldn't you be interested in knowing what he says about the evidence of the resurrection? Hello? Listen to what he says. I say unequivocally, That the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so overwhelming that it compels acceptance by proof, which leaves absolutely no room for what? No. Jesus is resurrected from the dead. But with all this evidence, this greatest fact of history, this brightest morning, why did Jesus have to be resurrected from the dead? Just why did he have to be resurrected from the dead? I mean, God could have said, there you go, died for you on the tree, it's finished, how do you like me now? You know, I mean, God could have said that, but he didn't. So why did Jesus have to be resurrected from the dead? Well, there are two reasons. First of all, his resurrect- he was resurrected to give credibility to his claim. He was resurrected to give credibility to his claim. 
What is it that makes Jesus different from all the other teachers that have ever appeared on the face of the earth? There are a lot of great teachers, a lot of great philosophers, a lot of great thinkers who have appeared. So what is it that makes Jesus different than all these other teachers that have lived on the face of the earth? Listen, our faith doesn't rest on the teachings of Jesus. Even though his teachings are amazing, incredible, heralded as some of the greatest moral teaching that have ever been proposed on the face of the earth, the teachings of Jesus are absolutely incredible and have stood the test of time for over 2,000 years. But the foundation of our faith is not based on the teachings of Jesus. And the foundation of our faith is not based and rest on the church. Although the church is an incredible institution, it's taken some hits down through the years, but it's an amazing institution of, of a unity and, and a formation and, and benevolence in the world today. But there are other organizations that have lasted over 2,000 years that are equally benevolent in the world today. So our faith doesn't rest on the church. Our faith doesn't even rest on the peace that comes from being in Christ. And make no mistake about it, there is a peace That comes when you are in Christ. A peace the Bible says that passes all understanding. But our faith doesn't base and doesn't rest on the peace of Christ. Our faith doesn't even rest on the fact that Christianity works. And it does work in an amazing way. Christianity as a result of that, your faith, many of your marriages have been saved. Your your lives have been made whole. Uh, Drugs have been overcome because of your faith in Christ. Christianity works, there's no question. But our faith in Christ is not based on the fact that Christianity works. Our faith in Christ is not even based on the death and the the burial of Christ. Listen, the foundation of our faith rises and falls in a single event. Not on the teachings of Christ, as amazing as they are. Not on the miracles of Christ, as, as undisputed as they are. Not even on the crucifixion and the death of Christ. The foundation of our faith rises and falls on a single event. And that event is the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That is the basis of our faith. The apostle says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3-8, through 8, For what I received, I passed on to you as first importance. This is primus, he says. This is is the most important thing. Everything else is good, but this is where our faith rests. He said, for what I received, I passed on to you as first importance. That Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. That he was buried and that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. He appeared to James and then to the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me as one abnormally born. So the foundation of our faith is not the teachings, not the miracles. The foundation of our faith is the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Folks, listen, the resurrection of Jesus is the autograph of his authenticity. It it is a signing of his name. This is who I am, God in the flesh. And the resurrection of Jesus is the autograph of his authenticity. The apostle says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 14 through 20, And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is useless. We're just wasting our time in here today. For 37 years, I've just been blowing smoke if Christ is not raised from the dead. And what's more, he says, if Christ is not raised from the dead, our our preaching is useless, and and so is your faith. You just believe in a specter, a ghost. You've been duped if Christ has not been raised from the dead. And he says more than that, we are found to be false witnesses about God, for we've testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But if he did not raise him, in fact, from the dead, if the dead are not raised... For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is what? And you're still in your sins. And then those who have fallen asleep in Christ, those who place their hope, I hope that I'm going to be resurrected. I hope I'm going to go to heaven when I die. Those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost if Christ isn't raised from the dead. They died with a foolish hope, with no foundation. Paul says in verse 19, if only for this life we have hope in Christ. In other words, if if our hope in Christ is just because it works in our lives today, 
If our hope in Christ is just based today because being a Christian is a good thing. If, if, if only in this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. You're just a fool. But he goes on in verse 20 to say this. And you've heard me say before that many times in the Bible there are big buts. And this is one of those big buts. And this is what he says. Read aloud with me, would you? Here we go. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. None of this means anything unless it's true. And the evidence is overwhelming. And that's why Jesus had to be resurrected from the dead. He was resurrected to give credibility to his claim to be God. But there's a second reason that Jesus was for his resurrection. And that is he was resurrected to give hope to his followers. He was resurrected to give hope to his followers. Think about the people in chapter 27. Mary Magdalene. This is the same Mary that the Bible says that Jesus cast out seven demons. Now, demons can be uh, emissaries from hell, satanic uh, messengers, but demons can also be the demons that we deal with in life. I have no reason to dispute that these were not demonic forces from hell, but sometimes those demonic forces from hell can also create demons in all of us. All of us have demons to some degree, don't we? And Mary had seven, which is a significant number in the Bible because seven is the number of completion. This woman was overwhelmed by her demons until she met Jesus. And Jesus cast them out. And she'd placed her hope. She had hitched her wagon to his star. And then she watched as his daddy body was put in the tomb and the stone was rolled in front of it. And her wagon went down the tubes. Peter, remember Peter? When Jesus said, I'm going to be going to Jerusalem, I'm going to be tried and arrested and crucified, Peter said, "Uh uh-uh, no, Lord. Listen, they're going to have to go through me to get to you. I'll take a bullet for you. But the night that Jesus was arrested in the garden and taken to Caiaphas' house, Peter traveled along, but instead of standing for Jesus, he stood outside by the fire and denied that he even knew Jesus not once, not twice, but three times, the last time with a curse. And his hope had been in Jesus. And when they rolled the stone in front of the tomb, his hope was gone. Remember the two on the way to Emmaus? Seven miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus. And as they were walking along, they were downcast. Uh, The word downcast is very unique in, in the Greek language. It means that your face is hanging lower than a snake's belly. No, I'm kidding. That's just a joke. But you know what downcast look like. In fact, Jesus is the one who walked up to them. They didn't know it was Jesus. They said, why are you so downcast? And they said, man, don't you know what's going on in Jerusalem? And they began to tell him that they had placed their hope. They'd put the, the eggs of their hope in the basket of Jesus. And then when Jesus was crucified and put in the tomb and they rolled the stone in front of it, their eggs were all broken. Remember Thomas? Thomas, I think his, his doubt was equal to his hope. And his hope was in Jesus. But when Jesus was crucified and put in the tomb and the stone was rolled in front of it, his hope was, was dashed and doubt filled his heart. And for every one of these individuals, when Jesus died and the stone rolled closed, their hopes were dashed to pieces. But then Jesus came out alive again. And when Mary was in the garden and, and that gardener said, as she thought it was a gardener, why are you weeping? She said, they've taken my Lord away and I don't know where they put him. And Jesus spoke to her and said, Mary. And when she heard his voice, she knew exactly who it was. And she turned to him and said, Rabbi. And she grabbed a hold of him and wouldn't let go. And Jesus said, back off, woman. Would you back off a little bit? Come on, man. You know, I've got to, at some time I've got to go to my God and your God, so you're going to have to let go a little bit. Remember Peter? When they'd gone up to go fishing in the Sea of Galilee, and they pulled up close to the shore to clean their nets, and they saw somebody on the shore making breakfast, and John said, I looks like Jesus. And when 
Peter realized who it was. He jumped out of the boat and swam to shore. He wanted to be the first one to get to Jesus. You remember the apostles in that upper room? They were amazed at when Jesus appeared before them, the good news that they had. And when the, seven, when the two men on the road to Emmaus ran back seven miles, they didn't run to the butt, bum leg, I can tell you that, but seven miles back to Jerusalem and announced that Jesus was alive, they didn't believe at first until Jesus appeared in their midst. And then they believed. But Thomas wasn't there. And after Jesus had departed, they said, we've seen the Lord. And Thomas said, I will not believe until I can see the nail prints in his hand, until I can put my hand in the spear thrust in his side. And a week later, in that upper room, Jesus appeared. And he said, peace be with you. And then he turned to Thomas a week later and said, Thomas, here, take a look. Take a look. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas fell down before his Lord and said, My Lord and my God. Don't miss that second phrase. My Lord and my God. Folks, listen, that first Easter was so good because that first Friday had been so bad. That first Easter was so good because that Friday had been so bad. Now, unfortunately, August 2011 seems to have a Friday feel about it, doesn't it? A lot of bad news out there. I don't remember a time in my life when we are more in need of hope and promise. So many people today have that Friday feeling. Families are falling apart around us. I have no doubt that your kids are going to go to school and they're going to come home. And you know, my good friend Bobby, his mommy and daddy aren't living together anymore. Even right in our own church, we have people who are bailing on their marriages. Unemployment is, is amazing. Jobs are scarce. Unemployment is rampant. I mean, the good news this week is that unemployment moved from 9.2% to 9.1%. Let's have a party. The American economy is in shambles. Financial pressure abound. For the first time in our nation's history, the first time in our nation's history, the credit rating in the United States has been downgraded. And we have no idea what the outflow of that is going to be in the days ahead. And the whole world economy is shaky right now at best. Morals and values that were once held dear are just being mocked and devastated. Have you literally watched TV lately with an open eye? And on and on it goes. And we look at our world today and it makes us ask, just what are we counting on? What, what am I building my life on that is solid enough to give me hope and courage that this world can't take away? Folks, that's why this message today is so important. This is a message today of hope and courage that nothing, that nothing can take away. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, Peter says, Praise be to God and the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a what kind of hope? A living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never poise, uh, perish, spoil, drop 500 points in one day or be downgraded. It will not fade and it will be kept in heaven for you. Folks, listen, for 2,000 years, Christ followers have not met on Easter or Resurrection Day to say, the stock market has risen. The stock market has risen, indeed. For 2,000 years, the church has not met together on Easter and said, my 401K has risen. My 401K has risen, indeed. Unemployment has dropped. Unemployment has dropped, indeed. My house value has risen. My house value has risen indeed. For 2,000 years, believers in the resurrected Christ have faced poverty and disease and pain and hardship and even death itself in victory and in courage and hope because Christ has risen. Christ has risen 
indeed. John Ortberg, a great preacher in Central California, great author, preaches near Stanford University, and he heard that a speaker was going to be lecturing on the resurrection of Jesus, and he knew he wouldn't believe in it, but he wanted to go to the lecturer to hear what he had to say. And the lecturer, again, uh, pointed out that Jesus didn't rise from the dead because nobody can rise from the dead. And he stated that Jesus didn't really rise from the dead, that it was just a metaphor that the early church had contrived to continue the hope that they had while Jesus was alive. When Jesus was alive, they had hope. When he died, they decided to make the whole thing up as a metaphor, as a symbol um, that Jesus uh, was, was really alive when he wasn't. And the idea of the resurrection, he says, was a metaphor, a symbol, but it didn't really happen. To which John Ortberg writes, There's a problem with that. Something happened 2,000 years ago that galvanized a large and growing group of people that so transformed their thinking and lives that even at the risk of death, they proclaimed not a metaphorical resurrection, but a literal physical resurrection. And he is exactly right. Folks, listen, Christians didn't form the world's first community to include Jews and non-Jews, men and women, slave and free, rich and poor, because of a metaphorical resurrection. Christians didn't willingly give up land and property and possessions and reputation and safety for a symbol of resurrection. Christ's followers didn't willingly give up their lives, sometimes by the thousands, believing that it was okay because they would receive a metaphorical resurrection in heaven. No, Christians did it willingly because they knew and believed that not a metaphor, not a symbol, but a very real physical man emerged from that tomb on that first Easter. They touched him. They held him. They ate with him. They watched him eat. They walked with him. And they talked with him. And they believed without a doubt that Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. And that, my friends, is why Jesus had to be resurrected from the dead. He was resurrected to give credibility to his claim to be God. And he was resurrected to give hope to his followers. Now let me tell you what that means to you and I in August of 2011. The resurrection means that our past can be forgiven. That our past can be forgiven. Let me see a show of hands. Have any of you made any mistakes in life? Any of you ever made a mistake in life? Raise your hand. Okay. Let me ask you another question. With a show of hands, uh, how many of you have ever stumbled in sin? Wow, I felt the breeze. It's amazing. <laughs> Let me ask you another question. Uh, how many of you struggle with hurts and habits and hang-ups today? How many of you still do that? You are bad people. <laughs> Remember Peter? As Peter said, I'll take a bullet for you, Jesus, and then when given the opportunity, denied that he even knew him three times. And Peter had to wonder in his heart of hearts, is there anything in any way that I can be forgiven? Any way. And the Bible says that when the risen Christ appeared to the women in Mark chapter 16, verse 7, listen to this, amazing, that, that the risen Christ appeared to these women and said, but but go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you into Galilee, and there you will see him just as he is. Now, why did these angels single Peter out? Why Peter of all of them? Why didn't the angel say, but but you go tell uh, his disciples and John, the one he loved, You go tell his disciples and tell Thomas, because you know Thomas doubts a lot. Why did they say, you go tell his disciples and Peter? I'll tell you why. Because Peter is just like me, steeped in sin. And the question is, could Jesus ever forgive my sin? And when Jesus appeared before his disciples in the upper room, the Bible says in the story, page 379 or Luke chapter 24, then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures and he told them this is what was written, that the Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance and what? 
forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations. Folks, listen, nothing, nothing you have ever done is beyond God's ability to cleanse and forgive. Because the Christ who died on the cross is risen. He is risen indeed. Is that good news today? But there's another meaning for this resurrection for us in 2011, and that is that our future is secure. Our future is secure. There's a lot of stuff going on in the world, scary stuff going on in the world today. Can I get a witness to that? A lot of scary stuff going on in the world today. And there may be some scary stuff going on in your life today, financially, relationally, physically. In John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus said this, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. I'm going to start again. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. Jesus pulls no punches. This is a tough old world. He said you can still have peace, but there will be trouble in this world. You say, well, how can I have peace if there's trouble in this world? Well, Jesus goes on and says this. Take heart, because I have overcome this world. Now, circle that word overcome. The word overcome in the Greek language is the, literally translated as the word nikao here, or nike, or we would say nike. And the word itself means victory. And Jesus said, listen... You can have peace in this world. Even though you live in a troubled time, you can have peace because I have victory over this world. When did Jesus give victory over this world? I'll tell you when. When the stone was rolled away from the tomb and Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Folks, listen. Jesus doesn't promise that there will be no more problems in life. But he did promise a happy ending. And all because he is risen. He is risen indeed. Dr. Donald Siemens was visiting a mission point in Africa. It was in Uganda, a very small village. And he went particularly to this village because um, the tribal chief of the village, who had been an Islamic man, a, a Muslim, had converted to Christianity. And as a result of that, the large portion of the tribe also converted to Christianity. And so Dr. Siemens wanted to find out what resulted in this man's transformation from following the Islamic faith to becoming a Christian. And so he asked him. And this is what that tribal chief said. Well, it is like this. Suppose you were going down the road and suddenly the road forked in two directions and you didn't know which way to go. And there at the fork in the road were two men, one dead and one alive. Which one would you ask for directions? <laughs> now I chuckled at that when I read it too. The reality is that some of you in this room are still listening to the dead man. Some of you are still hoping and placing your hope in the dead man who offers nothing to you. And with the good news that we've shared here today, I don't know how at the end of this service when we offer an opportunity for you to come to know Christ as Savior and Lord, I don't know how you could stay in your seat or leave this room without running down here to the front, pushing people out of the way. And say, I need Jesus because I'm tired of following the dead guy. Because there's one who is dead, but who has risen, who has risen indeed. And that's who we need to follow. And that's why Jesus was resurrected. To give credibility to his claim of being God. And to give hope to his followers. Which of these two guys will you listen to today for directions? The dead guy or the one who died and rose again. But that's your decision. 
Can I tell you mine? Christ has risen. He has risen indeed.